Good morning. Or should I say bonjour, comment allez-vous ce matin? It's a football reference, commiserations to, to England who were put out of the World Cup last night by France. <laughs> that's, that's one advantage of Scotland not qualifying for the World Cup. You're not disappointed when we get knocked out. So good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome, especially to any visitors with us this morning. Um, we're going to be flexible this morning because of the weather. We're delighted that um, Andy Scarcliffe is with us. Uh, he's on Zoom. He's joining us from the other side of Middleton Moor. Um, so it's good that you're with us. And uh, I trust that you can hear us and your sound's working. Uh, and I'll introduce you later on in the service, but um, thank you for bringing God's word to us today. So let's turn to God's word. I just have a, I want to read briefly from 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your love. We thank you that whilst we were in sin, you sent your son to be the sacrifice for that sin. That your love for us is so deep. Well, we thank you this morning that as we are reminded of that anticipation of the birth of your son, in the same way, Lord, we anticipate his second coming. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your provision. Jehovah Jireh, you're all that we need. Lord, in difficult times, Lord, may we lift our eyes to you. May we call on you. May we know your presence and your peace, a peace that comes not from the world. Lord, may we know you as our God, May we know your Son as our Lord and Saviour. And Lord, as we leave this place today, may we know your love in our life. Help us to bring our praise to you this morning. May it be pleasing and acceptable to you. Help us to worship you, our God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
given kisses on the friend's betrayal. He was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for a world's transgressions. He was suffering to save the lost. They fight for breath, they fight for me. Losing sinners from the claims of
please take a seat. This is where we need to be flexible. Bill was going to be doing intercessory prayer, but he's not here with us today. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can come into this place, Lord, and be together and worship you and know your presence. Lord, we pray for those who are gathering all around your world. We pray particularly for those who cannot gather safely in those countries where it is illegal and there is a real fear for, for life and injury to gather together in your name. Lord, we pray for them this morning that wherever they are, Lord, your presence would be with them, that they would know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in their midst. And Lord, that you would protect them. Lord, we pray for those people in, in the world who are suffering from, from war and all the disruption that that brings. Oh, we pray for your, your sons and daughters, Lord, that they would know your presence in that difficult time. That when there appears to be no hope, that their hope might be in you. That your light might shine in their darkness. Lord, give us a compassion in our hearts. For we don't know today in this place what that must be like. But give us a compassion for them, to pray for them, to hold them up. As we've sang, Lord Jesus, you are in heaven right now, interceding for us. So we intercede for them today, Lord. Lord, we pray for our church family. We pray for all of those here today and on Zoom, all of those who can't make it and they're at home. Lord, we pray for one another. You know us, you know every hair on our head. You know the troubles and difficulties that we face, whether physically, mentally or emotionally. Or help us to know that you are with us, that you not only care for us, but that you love us. Not only do you love us, but you sent your only son to die for us because of that love. Lord, we pray for our town. Lord, as we think of the work of the food bank, we pray at this time for all of those people who give of their time to volunteer in that service. Lord, we also pray for those who would need to avail of that service, who need to use that service, particularly over this winter period. Lord, there may well be many people that feel the need to use the food bank services, even though they're in work. There might be an embarrassment, there might be a shame. Please, Lord, we, we ask that you would take that from them, that they would be received with a cheerful smile when they get their food parcels, Lord, and that they would feel uplifted. Well, we thank you for your provision. Help us to understand how blessed we are. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that as we intercede this morning for one another, that you intercede for us. You died on the cross and you rose again. You're seated at the right hand of God the Father and you intercede for us daily. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your presence this morning. And we pray in your majestic and powerful and holy name. Amen.
huntsmen bring their treasures Shepherds bound low Angel voices sing Peace on earth What have I to offer To heaven's King I will bring my life, my love, my own It was time for Elizabeth to have her baby. She gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, well, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our forefather Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God.
by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Let's um, stand again to sing our next song, Into the Darkness of This World. Into the darkness of this world Into the shadows of the night into this loveless place you came Lightened our burdens, eased our pain And made these hearts your home Into the darkness once again Oh come, Lord Jesus, come Come with your love to make us whole Come with your light to lead us on Driving the darkness far from our souls Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come Into the longing of our souls Into these heavy hearts of stone Shine on us now your piercing light Order our lives and souls aright By grace and love unknown Until in you our hearts unite Oh come, Lord Jesus, come Jesus, we do. We pray that you would come. Lord, we look forward in anticipation to that day when you come again to reign in glory and in majesty. Lord, we pray this morning that you would anoint Andy, that you would, you would allow him to share your word, your word boldly with us. Lord, open our ears and our hearts that we might hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we thank you again that that Andy is able to join us on Zoom, that the weather cannot stop him being with us today, Lord. We pray and we believe that you have a word for us today. Lord, may we hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This might take a little bit of time to get Andy up and running with the technology. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Morning, Andy. Good, Over good to morning. You. Hi there. Um, so shall I go for it? Yes, please. Great. Excellent. And I, I would so look, looking forward to joining you physically down there in, in Gala Shields, but weather warnings seem to be uh, suggesting that maybe there was going to be difficult uh, conditions on the road. So I thought that I would um, play safe, but hopefully at some point in the near future, I can join you physically. <clears throat> but it's, uh, I think this is the first time I've preached on this actual passage from 57 to 80 in Luke chapter 1. I've preached on the first part many times, so I'm, I really appreciate being asked to preach on something I haven't preached before. And you likely need to know, one minute if I get my PowerPoint going, you likely need to know that Christmas is about two special babies and two holy families. Um not everyone realizes that. And I suppose if you asked a man in the street, who is Zechariah and Elizabeth, they might not be able to tell you who they were. They would likely be able to tell you about John the Baptist, but not about Zechariah and Elizabeth. And I suppose it's understandable because the story surrounding Jesus is so visually exciting. You've got this wonderful story of this teenage girl who is, uh, is spoken to by an angel. She falls pregnant by the Holy Spirit. There's the gossip that goes on and the and the near divorce from from uh, from Joseph. There's the stable. There's the heavenly choir. There's the shepherds. Um, even the the flight into Egypt. There's the three wise men. So all of that stuff is visually stunning. But it's understandable that we can we might be in danger of overlooking John's birth because. It's, it's less visually stunning. At least we, we get less detail. I assume John was born not in the Western General, but at home. And I assume uh, that Zechariah and Elizabeth, um, well, basically, perhaps less visually interesting because they were at least in their 50s, possibly the 60s or 70s when they had this special child, uh, Elizabeth having been barren, having been unable to have children. And so although Jesus' uh, story lends itself to cards and films and songs and all of the stuff that we get at Christmas, John's was a far more ordinary birth and yet absolutely crucial and yet um, vitally important to the story of Christmas. So I thought this morning we could look at, in terms of three sections, look at Elizabeth, then look at Zechariah, then look at John, which is a fairly logical way of of structuring it. But if we start with Elizabeth, um, we see her moving from disgrace to joy. And she actually uses the term disgrace. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son, verse 57. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. Close-knit community, likely quite a small community. So they were all involved in this wonderful, wonderful gift. And then Luke 1, 25, going back into the previous part of the story, uh, Elizabeth says, In these days the Lord has shown his favour and taken away my disgrace among the people. Uh, this gives us a kind of hint at the long, painful journey that she had been on. She was, in, she was part of a, a, an honoured tradition among the Jewish people. You've got a number of folk, a number of women who were barren, who were unable to have children, and yet God gives them miraculously the gift of a child. You've got Abraham and Sarah for a start, the father of the faithful. They were in their 90s, for goodness sake, when they were given the gift of Isaac, who would be a blessing, a means of blessing to the whole world. You've got Rachel barren and pleading with God for the gift of a son, and ultimately Joseph is born and Joseph becomes a kind of savior to his people as he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. Manoah's wife, we don't even know her name, gave birth to Samson. He was a bit of a mixed blessing, but he got it right towards the end of his life and um and and became a kind of deliverer for his people. And you've got Hannah um actually pleading with God in silent, desperate prayer in the in the temple, to the extent that Eli the priest thinks, my goodness me, she's drunk. I'd better get her out of here. And she says, no, 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 I'm pleading with God for a child. And Samuel was given and he became one of the greatest leaders of the Jewish people. So she was in an honoured tradition, Elizabeth, as she herself was desperate for a child. 
And I can imagine, I'm reading into the passage, not out of it now, I can imagine in our youth, um, no doubt she and Zechariah, when they get married, they'd be hanging out with the people that they had known, perhaps from childhood, perhaps gone through school with them. And one by one, these other couples would be having their first child, perhaps even their second, their third child, by which time the first child was maybe taking on father's business. And all through the decades, Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer was not answered. Remember, in the first part of the story, the angel says, your prayer has been heard. Whether they were still praying it or whether they'd given up, it doesn't say. But the reality is that um, she has this wonderful gift. And in her youth and throughout those early years, there would be the painful reality of not being able to be part of this wider community, having children. And I should imagine that at some point they would have given up. And, and actually, um, when, he's, when she talks about disgrace among the people, it was actually grounds for divorce for any husband whose wife could not give him a child. And so there was this unanswered prayer, possibly gossip, because they had the view that perhaps um, God was punishing you in some way if you weren't able to have children. And all of a sudden there's this wonderful gift and she's filled with the Holy Spirit in the early part of the of the passage when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, verse 41. The baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women. This is her speaking to Mary when Mary visited her, remember. And blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She was maybe the first person in history to call Jesus Lord. It took the disciples three years before they could fall at his feet and say, my Lord and my God. But here's Elizabeth before he's even born saying, he is my Lord. And the wonderful um, story here tells us, it's not just a history lesson, this happened 2000 years ago. It speaks to you in your situation. And God is saying to you, Despite your limitations, despite what other people say about you and their assumptions, despite your circumstances, despite unanswered prayer, and that's a struggle, isn't it? When there's silence from heaven, it would seem God has your life in the center of his hands. I was reading about Helen Rosevear, a, a missionary to Africa who um, she was working with this particular tribe and there was this young woman who died in childbirth and they were trying to save this little baby and they needed an incubator to keep her warm uh, in the cold African nights and they prayed that somehow God would help them and they actually prayed that God would send them a hot water bottle to keep this little baby warm and so they gathered round and they prayed and then there was this little voice at the side where a little African girl prayed this prayer. Oh, and oh Lord, please send a dolly so that this little baby isn't lonely without her mother or brothers and sisters. And they patted her on her head and thought that's a lovely little prayer. Later that day, a large box appeared sent from the UK. And they unpacked it. And one of the first items they took out of that box was, can you guess, a hot water bottle. But there was one little girl who was determined to see if there was anything else in that box. She rummaged to the bottom and triumphantly pulled out this little dolly. Her prayer had been answered. But you need to know that that box was packed and planned five months earlier by a woman's guild in Scotland, and they sent it out. Uh, what does that say to us? Well, God isn't taken by surprise by our needs. He plans for them. He knows them. And he had plans for Elizabeth and Zechariah long before they had any hint of the gift of a child. So Elizabeth, from disgrace to joy. But then you move on to Zechariah, and he's an interesting character. Because he moves from unbelief to faith. And remember, you I think you studied it last week, but the first part of the story, 
the, he asks the angel, when the angel says you're going to have a son, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel said to him, I think the angel's a wee, wee bit put out. I am Gabriel. In other words, do you know who you're speaking to? I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe uh, my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So uh, it's there's a mild punishment there because of his unbelief, his lack of faith, which you can understand. I mean, I think which one of us would say, oh, yeah, that's great. Mind you, he was an angel coming from heaven. So it does add to his argument. But the reality was that Zechariah wasn't absolutely sure. And it's possible that he was dumb as well, because if you look at verse 62, they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. But they had to make signs to him. So it's possible that he was dumb and deaf for the, that period of time. And he was given wonderful set of gifts, even before Christmas, for goodness sake, given the gift of a son. He was given the gift of his voice back. He was given the gift of the Holy Spirit and he was given the gift of prophecy. Look at verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. And he may even have been given the gift of faith as well, because to, to Zechariah, these events were a present reality. He speaks in the past tense. Verse 69, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy, to remember his holy covenant, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve his, him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So as far as Zechariah was concerned, hey, this is a done deal. This has already happened. Such was his faith as he faced uh, the future and as he looked on his little boy, John. And you'll notice that he asks for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. But you'll notice that um, it, on the eighth day, verse 59, they came to circumcise the child. This seems to have been a community event. And they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up. No, he is to be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among the relatives who has that name. In other words, it's never been done this way before. Surely you'll call him Zechariah. That's the way we do it here. And it's as if God was giving a hint, even in the names, that something special and something new and something wonderful was starting to happen in the birth of John and in the birth of Jesus. God was doing a new thing as he prophesied in the prophecy of Isaiah 43. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you see it? It's already happening. And that was happening with the birth of John. Oswald Chambers says, we impoverish and weaken God's work in us the moment we forget he is almighty. The impoverishment is in us, not in him. We will come to Jesus for him to be our comforter or our sympathizer, but we refrain from approaching him as our almighty God. And this is a challenge to you and me. In a culture which is post-Christian, a culture which is secular, when the statistics are telling us, certainly in England recently, um, the statistics are that for the first time, church attendance has gone below 50%. And the danger is we think, can God do anything about all of this? In gala shields with our friends who don't go to church and seem, seem to show no interest, can God do anything? And I think the Holy Spirit would want to say to us this morning, I'm doing a new thing. 
And we've got to throw out that comment. It's never been done this way before. We need to hear Zechariah saying his name not will be John. His name is John. This is the new thing that God is doing. We had to learn this when I was in my third church in Barnton Baptist Church. We met in a, a school gymnasium and we, uh, under God's blessing, outgrew it and were looking for another uh, another venue. And I obsessively traveled around the community looking for empty churches, empty factories, empty anything that we could meet in. And there was nothing. And one day, one or, one or two of our folk came up to us, a young married couple came up and said, look, we are members of the David Lloyd Center in Kerstorfen. Um, they have a function suite. Let's try it out and see whether that works. So we did one weekend and it was the most wonderful venue ever. Um, and it was quite cheap, which was a, 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 an added bonus. But here's the problem. Barnton, when it was planted, had a vision for Barnton itself. Going to Kerstorfen meant going two, three, four miles down the road. And there were those who said, no, no, God has said we are for Barnton. They were called to Barnton. We prayed about it. We discussed it. We, we, we deliberated it over it. Shall we move? And I have to confess that there's more claims for infallibility I've heard in evangelical churches than ever in from the Pope, the Pope in the Vatican. That's what God said. And that's what he wants us to do. And people said, well, look, Maybe God wants us to do something. Maybe he's doing something fresh, something new. And to everyone's um, bl blessing, unanimously, we decided to go to Kerstoff and, and God blessed us there in the most wonderful way. David Lloyd Center was effectively a virtual community of six to nine thousand people. So you're talking about a virtual community that was the size of a small town. And we were blessed. That, interestingly, recently in the past year, couple of years, they've moved back to Barnton. So the original vision is being realized as they now have their own premises. But this little story reminds us that if we're going to reach Gala Shields, if we're going to reach people in this post-Christian age, we maybe need to do things in a new way and not say it's never been done this way before. And so for us, it's a challenge to us. Um, and with Zechariah, we ought to be saying his name is John. And lastly and briefly, we see John, the forerunner. And they all ask the question, verse 66, everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be for the Lord's hand was with him. And Mark, in the start of his gospel, dispenses with anything about nativity and the birth of Jesus. He goes straight for the jugular, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he goes straight into the story of John, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths um, for him. Now, John's ministry was quite different from Jesus. Jesus did all the good stuff. You know, he healed the blind man at the side of the road. He um, he forgave the, the woman caught in adultery. He raised the wee girl from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He walked on water. He killed, he, he, he calmed the storm. He he hung out with Matthew and his friends at parties. He, he, he fed the 5,000. He turned water into wine. And I have a feeling that if John had been right behind him, he'd have been turning it back into water because John had this Nazarite vow where he would not drink strong drink at all. Um, and so quite different um, ministries. And John was a kind of social misfit. He was a loner. He wore the strangest kind of clothes. Um and uh, he, his diet was strange. I mean, um, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, has nothing on John. I mean, locusts and wild honey. His preaching was a challenge. He said, I don't care what ceremonies you've been through, circumcision and so on. Get in the water and have your sins washed away. Now, if we want to go to God, we need to go through Jesus. But if we want to get to Jesus, we need to go through John. 
And what I mean by that is we need to hear his message of repentance and turn from our sin in order to find Jesus and his salvation. And I think we like John because of his human frailty. Remember, towards the end of his life, he was in prison and he sent two of his disciples to Jesus. And he said, are you the one that is to come or are we to expect another? And Jesus lovingly sends the message back. Go and tell John what you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The deaf are healed. And in other words, these are signs of the Messiah's kingdom coming. And so uh, the one who had pointed to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world was going through his deepest, darkest doubts, the dark night of the soul. And God has a place for those of us who are doubters. Those of us who go through those periods of darkness where we think, is what God has said to me true? And that's what John went through. I think we like that in John. Um, but when we think of John, he was a, a forerunner preparing the way for Jesus. That's what Mark tells us. And that's what the gospel writers tell us. In those days, if a king visited his kingdom or visited a region of his, of his kingdom, he would send a forerunner and he would fill in the potholes in the roads. I wish someone would send a forerunner to Edinburgh. <laughs> well, for goodness sake, we could do with some forerunners filling in the potholes, lowering the bumps, making the way clear for the king to come. The forerunner would go to the inns and the hotels and say, the king's coming. Um, do you have some accommodation for two weeks time? We'll need 10 rooms for him and his servants or whatever, whatever. And John was preparing the way for Jesus to come into the hearts and lives of men and women. And Galashiels Baptist Church is a John the Baptist to your community. You are the ones who prepare the way for the coming of the Holy Spirit into the lives of the people that you live amongst. You are a John the Baptist for the people in your family for the people in your street, for the people in the pub that you go to on a, uh, on a Saturday, on a, a Friday night or whenever, the people at the gym, people at your work. God says, I want you to prepare the way for the coming of my son into their lives. And so like Elizabeth this morning, we can be assured that God has heard our prayers and has a wonderful plan for us. Like Zechariah this morning, even if we at times doubt and have faith, he has wonderful gifts for us to enable us to speak to people and to point to Jesus. And like John this morning, we are called to prepare the way for the Messiah to come into people's lives in Gala Shields and in our own network of relationships. So can we pray just now? that God will help us to do that and then I'll hand it back to the worship leader. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. We thank you for John, the forerunner, the one who prepares the way for Jesus. But we thank you that there was a way to prepare. We thank you that there was a goal for that way and that was, that was Jesus the Messiah. We thank you that at this Christmas time and in Advent, we can prepare our hearts as we remember the coming of the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Saviour of the world. Help us to be, as it were, forerunners in people's lives as we point to Jesus and as we share the good news of the kingdom of God with them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's close our service this morning by singing this wonderful carol, joining with the message of the angels, proclaiming glory to God. Hark the herald, angels sing.
and sinners reconciled. Joyful, all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark, the herald angels sing. grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore until Jesus call or come again. Amen. <laughs>